what? During birth, it should open up. Uh, as baby is developing, it should be closed. D, therefore, below that is the vagina. That's where the sperm is deposited. Okay? So let's move on. Let's go to the part, uh, question two. Which of the following will happen if structure X is removed from the body? So I say there's no X over here. The X should have been at the epididymis. The best answer in this case would be that sperms produced will be unable to swim. Why? Because the function of the epididymis is to allow maturation of the sperm to take place. Let's work backwards. Supposing the supposing the other three were correct answers, and we ask you instead to put an X on the male reproductive system to tell me which part will have been disrupted. So for example, let's say if I say that the volume of semen will be less, let's work backwards up. Huh? Maybe the symptom of this person is that he has less semen. If I ask you to place an X on the part of the male repo system that is disrupted, where could you place this X? Okay, everyone, a quick box. Where could you place this X if I ask you to disrupt this person's body such that the outcome is the volume of semen is less? Okay, then let's listen to your point now. Uh. Union, you say 
takes some time. Why do you think it might take some time? Okay, because it produces hormones. Then I ask, you relate back to the chapter on the endocrine system. Actually, that's where hormones are produced, right? So actually, we work backwards, huh? Endocrine system responsible for hormones. And where are hormones produced to? Your bloodstream. So this goes into your bloodstream. All the hormones that we are talking about in this chapter, I give you some examples. You've heard of testosterone, yes. testosterone. Then for the ladies, you also have estrogen, progesterone. You should learn the functions today. These are hormones that are produced into your bloodstream. So it doesn't make sense for males to produce testosterone, then go out the bus deference, then after that go out the body. Don't make sense. Okay, so it's not an exocrine gland. Um, same for the ladies. Estrogen progesterone is not pro produced to be secreted out of the body. It's produced so that it travels through your bloodstream and affect various parts of the body to carry out its function. Okay, so this is a link that you can draw to the previous chapter. Okay, let's look at some questions that you may or may not have. If you still don't have, okay, then we can move on already. Yeah? One of the major functions that I would like all of us to be very aware of in this chapter. Okay, today we're going to go on to the next part of the chapter. Let's go on to part C. The ovarian and uterine cycle. That is our scope for today. As with every chapter, we have one segment that is very, very difficult to understand. The cardiac cycle, the cardiovascular system, remember that bra, very complicated. When we look at the respiratory system, it's the mechanism of breathing. Okay, so I'd like you to pay special attention to this part of the chapter. You are expected to know this. Yeah? You are expected to understand and be able to describe and write this out. This was very daunting, so my role today is to illuminate. We look at each sentence, what does each sentence mean? Usually, by the end of the session, at least for myself, once you understand these words, all you really have to remember are these flow charts. One, two, three flow charts. Okay, I say again, usually if you understand these words, you just remember the flow charts for your revision and you describe the flow charts. Okay, that's from my experience. Huh? I find this very challenging also. Every year, because I recorded myself teaching this chapter, 
I reward myself teaching myself so that I can teach you all. Okay, so it is it is challenging. Okay, may I get your help right now to read just the ovarian cycle first? I'd like you to read the ovarian cycle. Try to see if it makes sense as you refer to the diagrams on the left hand side or for yourself up, upstream. Alright, prepare the whiteboard.
make sense of the various sentences. Okay? And I, I promise you after after this session, I hope that you do not need to refer to the words anymore. All you really need to revise are, are, are the diagrams, which is what I revise. Okay, because the words are very painful. Okay, perhaps let's begin first. Huh? I'll ask you a series of questions. You reply to see how much you manage to distill from your reading. Let's look at the ovarian cycle first. How many phases are there to the ovarian cycle? Okay, how many phases? Okay, we found the phases. Can you highlight the phases clearly? So, how many phases are there? Some of you say two. And what are the phases of these two? What are the two phases of the ovarian cycle? Okay, follicular and luteal. So those are the two phases. Please take note of these two phases. The name of these phases makes sense later on as we go through it. The next question for you. How many hormones do you identify that is required for the ovarian cycle to take place? Do you use maybe another color to highlight? All the hormones involved in this cycle. How many hormones and what are the hormones? There should be five in total. What hormones won't be produced anymore? 
if this person got brain damage, hypothalamus injured, what hormones will you expect to not be produced anymore? Okay, so this flow chart shows you so much information, more than just the sentences up there. That being said, actually, ladies, your the amount of stress you face, your emotions can influence the menstrual cycle that we're studying today. Because your hypothalamus, if you recall, is the key to controlling a lot of, of your endocrine system. Remember things like osmoregulation, thermoregulation, many things controlled by the hypothalamus, and now we know even the reproductive system. Therefore, when an individual is stressed, it can also affect the amount of gene oil you produce, amount, and therefore the amount of FSH and LH produced, and therefore impact the entire ovarian and uterine cycle. Let's go downstream a little bit more. Sentence 3. FSH stimulates the growth of these things called primary follicles, which you can highlight, aided by LH. Only one of these follicles will mature to become a gradient follicle, others will eventually break down. Next sentence 4. LH and FSH also stimulates the cells of the growing follicles to produce estrogen. Okay, so how do we make sense of all of this? I think the flow chart helps again. They said, number three, uh, FSH and LH stimulates the growth of follicles. So let's go downstream. It stimulates the growth of these things called follicles. That's sentence number three. And if we look at sentence number four, these follicles will then be responsible for secreting estrogen. We're almost there, right? Now we figured out where the hormones are produced, what they're produced by, in sequence, who produces what. I think the part that the textbook doesn't elaborate on is why the world are these things called follicles. Yeah, I used to think that when you look at a female's ovary, that when the eggs are produced, they kind of just erupt from the ovary and they just pop, pop, pop. But actually, there's a little bit more to that. If you look inside an ovary, every female has lots of these tiny structures called follicles. So I'm going to draw these structures, these cloud-like structures up, as follicles. If I were to zoom into one of these follicles, this is what you'll see. You will see a lot of cells. All of these cells are called follicular cells. And these cells surround the, the jewels, okay, the important thing, the egg, the human egg. Okay? This human egg, uh, when we say human egg, it's not quite like the bird egg and the reptile egg. It doesn't come with a shell. But if you like to think about it, we kind of have a shell. We have a shell of lots of small little cells. These cells help to nourish the egg, keep it alive, give it nutrients. Together, we refer to this structure as a follicle. Okay, and that's what the sentence is saying. The FSH stimulates these follicles to grow. Here I'm going to draw a follicle on the screen. So I think on yours, you see the follicle represented by this circle with a yellow cell inside. This is what you see on your diagram, something like that. But understand that within here you find many, many, many more cells. Interestingly, 
points will help to stimulate them to grow a little bit more. So in every AD, within them, in their ovaries, the potential is already there. Just waiting every month for these two hormones to be secreted to allow some of these follicles to grow. What do I mean by grow? This is what I mean. When, when I say grow, uh, I do not mean that the egg inside grows. I'm referring instead to the follicle. So imagine this particular follicle going inside. Lots more cells. Okay, lots and lots and lots of more cells. Here you still have a few. So that's why it means grow. Every month, uh, we get a few of these primary follicles attempting to make that journey to grow towards its ultimate stage. Okay, so again, every month, some of these primary follicles will try its best to grow towards its ultimate stage, which is what we call a Rodatian follicle. One will make it though, not all. So every month, uh, only one ovary, only one creative follicle, only one of the primary follicles will manage to grow to this stage. The rest won't really quite make it to that stage. Okay, so. When you look at this flow chart and you see the word grow, have in mind that this is what it means. And the two hormones responsible for this are LH and FSH. I'm going to try to use the same color schemes in the graph. If you find in your graph, you start off with LH at rather low levels. So this is LH. You also have FSH in orange, also at rather low levels. But these two hormones together are responsible for the growth of the follicle. Same thing as what you see in a flow chart. These follicles that are growing, as you recall in the flow chart, are also responsible for the secretion of a new hormone called estrogen. So if you look in your the next graphs below, you see that the estrogen levels are slowly increasing. Okay? They are gradually increasing because these primary follicles are secreting more and more and more of this estrogen. Okay, so I find this part of the chapter, students find there's a contradiction. When I first read this, I could not wrap my head around it either. Okay, so I have a read up at statements 4 and statements 5. There's something odd about statement 4 and 5. Will you tell me how the impact of estrogen on FSH and LH? Okay, everyone read statements 4 and 5. What is the impact of estrogen, this last hormone here, on FSH and LH? Then we talk about your opinion. What is the impact of estrogen on FSH and LH? Three statements, four and five.
impact of estrogen on these two hormones? And do you, have, do you find something a little bit incongruent? Okay, wait. Estrogen. Uh, give me one of the impacts. Okay, estrogen at low levels inhibits. Okay, so at low levels, it has a it, it has an inhibitory effect. It prevents small manifestation of LH to be produced. You kind of see this in the graph. When estrogen levels are low, okay, when estrogen levels are low, you observe that these two hormone levels are also very low. Other impact of estrogen. Saru? So at low levels, it has a negative impact. Okay. When, and they say, uh, when estrogen, so at statement five, when estrogen begins to accumulate. So over here, when estrogen levels are high enough, it instead has a positive feedback that you observe. Then the outcome is that LH levels suddenly surge, and FSH also increases in the mouth, which is very odd. Okay, on one hand, low levels, negative, in negative inhibition. But then at high levels, there's this positive effect. Can one hormone do two things? So I'd like you to try to uh, see if we can solve this puzzle. How can one hormone do two things? Because if you think about it, if when estrogen levels are low and it, it has a negative in, uh, inhibition on the FSH and LH, right? Then if I have more estrogen, shouldn't that negative inhibition increase? How come it switches to a positive feedback system? Solve this puzzle. Hidden piece of the puzzle is not shown in anywhere in this diagram. How can one hormone do two things? Two wild guesses. Things they may have something. Yeah, you can. That's fascinating. Um, Yishen has brought in the idea of receptors. When you look at hormones, we need receptors for it, right? Uh, you were saying that perhaps this receptor has multiple holes. If there is Maybe only if one of the binding sites are bound with estrogen, they have this impact. If you have more estrogen bound, you may have another impact. Okay, I think biologically, that is a very interesting theory. It could be possible. I think Yishin also kind of brought back one idea, one concept. Hormones rely on receptors to be able to carry out their function. So actually, quite close. Receptors are involved. Patricia? There be two receptors at different places, but the same hormone can bind to both receptors on both places. So actually, if I combine both up, Pratiksha um, plus exchange receptors idea, actually you are right. So that's how one hormone can do two things. Because at very low levels, it inhibits the anterior pituitary gland. But when the levels get high enough, so let's go to the other side. When the levels get high enough, it has a positive feedback system on the hypothalamus. Sorry? Ah, so does this continue to inhibit it? So when this is high enough and it influences this upstream, this one has a greater impact on the, the thing downstream already. 
imagine you have now more GnRH, and during the pituitary gland is more stimulated, this will have a higher amount also. So this one kind of overrides because it's more upstream. Which is, I think, quite a beautiful example of endocrine system at work. It reminds you that one hormone can have multiple effects if they are found on different organs. The reality our estrogen doesn't just impact the inferior pituitary gland or the hypothalamus. It also impacts many other parts of the body. It results in some parts growing more, some parts less. For males, testosterone doesn't just impact vocal cords, impacts how much hair is grown on the body, how the muscles will grow, how the bones will grow. So one hormone multiple receptors. Fun fact, actually women we also produce testosterone. Males also produce estrogen and progesterone. I have to admit, as I say this, I don't know where the males produce progesterone and estrogen. Not sure if the testicles also produce that. But it is this fine balance that influence the traits that we see on the surface. Maybe I have less body hair on my face right, because I have a little bit more estrogen and progesterone. I'm not sure. Okay, so this is the part that students find very hard to wrap their head around. How can one hormone have two impact? Well, that's because your flowchart doesn't show one key piece of information. So if you want to complete the picture, you zoom in to this part of your notes. The flow chart, the top left hand corner, what you could do is to draw an arrow that goes up to the anterior pituitary gland and put a negative inhibition. Then it kind of closes the loop. Human egg 
is the largest cell of the human body. So males, unfortunately, don't have that. But the egg is so big that you can see it without a microscope. How big is it? Take your pencil, mechanical pencil, you just put one dot on your paper. That is roughly how big it is. Then you just use a microscope, you can even see more details. So egg is actually really big. And inside every baby, in the ovaries, all possible eggs are already there. Just waiting for the follicles to develop. Oh, it's the creation follicle, is it? Okay, is it attached to the ovary? Okay, yes. So all these follicles are reside within the ovary. But when it is tight, the creation follicle will rupture to allow the, ov the, ov the egg to come up. Then the fallopian tube will come by and then you know, bring it in. Why do you ask? So we are done with the follicular phase and I hope you can see right now why it's called the follicular phase because in the first phase, it's all about getting the follicles to grow so that one of them can ovulate. That's the first phase. But once you go into the subsequent phases, you observe that egg. If I really have one egg in the system, I don't want to have too many eggs, right? Because the millions of sperm that come in, I'm going to have three babies at one go. Okay? And that's also why sometimes we have what, what do you call those twins? Huh? Not triplets. Twins are not triplets. So, so there's identical twins and then, or non identical twins. So, in the event when a lady releases more than one egg at one time, you could get non identical twins. These two twins are not identical, but by sheer sure fact that the two eggs are produced at the same time, both eggs end up developing within one. Why one egg at a time? And usually one ovary at a time. So one ovary produces one egg, next month the other ovary takes turn. But sometimes both ovary produce release one egg at, um, together. Yes, I see. Oh, oh, how do you decide which follicle is up developing? Further, it may have an inhibitory effect on the rest. 
prevent the rest from. Usually that's how biology goes, but I'm not very sure. Lah. That is my speculation. Okay, so where was I? After the egg is produced, actually, uh, what's left in the ovary is this kind of open wound, right? This egg has come out, but here I'm left with a structure with all the, it's like the bachelorette party has finished, then the party is over, but all the girlfriends are still there. Okay, but lady has gone off already. But this doesn't, this still serves a function. So, the remaining structure that you see over here, that you see in your diagram as well, is called corpus luteum. It's also why this phase is called the luteal phase. But this leftover structure, this leftover follicle, is still quite important because it produces a new hormone, that we, the final hormone that we've not spoken about. And that hormone is progesterone. If you look at the graphs, progesterone has been kind of at zero. But then uh, you find that after ovulation has occurred, the level goes up. Okay, that level goes up because of this structure here. This structure don't ju doesn't just produce progesterone, it also produces estrogen. So you find the estrogen levels dip for a short while, but then it rises again. It rises because this structure produces two hormones, the O as well as the Fascinating thing about hormones and receptors are, you know, sometimes when you have multiple hormones binding to the same organ, the outcome can be different from when you just have one of the hormones. When, as, when progesterone is produced at high levels, you combine these two together, the resulting impact isn't a positive stimulation, it is a negative inhibition. So it's 
complicated as all this is, I find what helps me most is to remember the flowchart. The flowchart is so much easier to remember, diagrammatically speaking, and to draw out. Then you write it out from there. First, you find that it's rather complicated to memorize the sentences without appreciating that you know, one hormone at low levels has this impact, and high levels has another impact. But with two hormones together, the impact is another, yet another impact. And this flowchart helps to draw relationships better. So when you revise, revise the flowchart. It shows the relationship which the sentences in sequence, in sequence don't quite show. And this ultimately is a good thing because if these two hormones levels are low, we will not get new primary follicles developing until the next ovarian cycle. It allows the female to focus on one egg at a time. And by day 28, the whole cycle will repeat itself. That's why we call this the ovarian cycle because we are observing how the ovarian develops over a cycle of 28 days. And once it's all over, it repeats itself. Month after month after month. Could this 28 days be lengthened or shortened? Can. What could impact it at the end of the day is a hypothalamus. If you're very stressed, huh? it could cause this cycle to shorten, it could cause it to lengthen. So at the end of the day, don't be surprised. This 28 days is nothing more than a model. Everybody has a slightly different cycle. And even your normal cycle can change over time. According to your age, according to your stress levels, the amount of sleep you get, because your brain hypothalamus needs to rest also, right? Okay, now sleep also can mess up all these cycles. Yes. Okay, how does the hypothalamus decide when to activate this again, isn't it? So, in reality, uh, this GNRH is always being produced. It is a matter of whether less or more is produced. You notice that every one point in time, you always have a hormone that's either negatively or positively inhibiting the hypothalamus. So, in other words, what I'm saying is that it's always switched on. It's a matter of every month, are we turning the volume up or down, up or down at various times of the cycle? Oh, how does it decide that we need to restart the whole process again? Okay, good question. Because eventually, this structure will heal and disappear. This negative inhibition will disappear. The whole cycle repeats itself. These two hormones will be produced again, produce new follicles, and it just repeats itself over and over and over again. So we'll take a short break now. Because that I find usually this part is too much really. Okay, uh, for yourself, you the story in a while. For yourself, in this break, you could try the questions below. Questions below takes you to step by step what we discussed. And you can see if you broadly understand the ovarian cycle. Sorry?
time to try the 10 questions. That's our practice. And also a self assessment. As you do the questions, any questions for me? Love to answer. If I fail as a teacher during this past hour, I've recorded myself teaching.
And even though uh, humans are one of the very, very few species that will break down the uterine lining and then after that inject it out of the body, uh, also called the menstrual flow. A lot of animals, when it comes to this that stage when they break it down, you know what they do? Just reabsorb it back into their body. So, very hassle free process. Don't quite know why humans go through this additional process. The only thing I can rationalize perhaps is that the amount of energy needed to inject it versus to reabsorb it is probably less. Okay? So probably humans need more energy to reabsorb it. That's why evolutionarily speaking, we decided to inject it out. But a lot of animals, you may be wondering, mammals especially, why they don't have menstrual flow. It's only because they reabsorb it back. So if you have a very good understanding of the ovarian cycle, the uterine cycle is actually extremely simple. May I refer you to the table right now? How many phases are there in the uterine cycle? Can you please have a look? If you look at your graph, you find that there are only three phases in the uterine cycle. The first phase, you find that the uterine lining is breaking down. And this phase is what we're describing as the menstrual flow phase. Menstrual flow. Okay, this is when the thick, bloody layer is breaking down. The next phase is when it builds up again. This is called the proliferative phase. Proliferative because this is when the cells proliferate, the endometrium builds up again. Finally, oh, what the last phase is called? Secretory. Last phase is the secretory phase because during this phase, lots of hormones are being produced. This phase, the layer is maintained. So actually, only three phases break down, build up, maintain. Break down, build up, maintain. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Yourself, you only need to know each phase, how these two hormones impact it. What do I mean? What causes the breakdown of the endometrium and menstrual flow? Yeah, when hot estrogen levels are low, when progesterone levels are low. What causes the endometrium to build up? when estrogen levels begin to increase. What causes the endometrium to stay in its current state when the estrogen levels are high and when progesterone levels are high? So that's all you need to know. You just need to know how these two hormones play a role at each stage. When both are low, it flows. They rise up. When both flow, flow. Okay? But if one is high, one is low, you start to have a build up, starts to build up again. When both are high, then you go into the secretory phase. That's all you need to know. Okay, so I find if you understand the ovarian cycle well, the menstrual, sorry, the uterine cycle is much simpler. Therefore, if one was to take birth control pills, you expect that the uterine cycle will also be affected. You expect that day will come, menstrual flow not happening. Well, if you consume a lot of estrogen and progesterone, it's going to maintain the layer rather than break it down. Okay? So once again, stress levels can affect all of this as well. So again, our class will miss lessons. Tomorrow is the HBL day. I'll not see you. But the next time I see you, we will be, I will see you again on the Monday in the lab. Then we will do, we will look at flower reproductive system. So we will look at flowers. Okay. For yourself, in the remaining time, uh, take the time to do the, these short questions, MCQ questions. To do a quick assessment of your understanding of the, the uterine as well as ovarian cycle. This is the toughest part of this chapter for the human side. Ecosystem. If you find this okay, then I think this chapter is quite good to go for you. It used to be tougher.
Thank you.